Our next speaker is Kevin Cody from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce this, I took too much French, which was useless, but the translation is, the same reality of each place is different, a case study of an organic farmer's market in Lima, Peru, I promised you we'd go to Lima. Kevin Cody is currently finishing a dissertation in sociology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. His, his dissertation explores emergent alternative food networks in the global south with case studies of an organic farmer's market and community garden in Peru. Working closely with an NGO called the Multinational Exchange for Sustainable Agriculture, Kevin is committed to building connections among farmers and alternative food advocates in the global north and south. Additional research interests include agrarian political economy, sustainable food systems, and rural development in Latin America. Please welcome Kevin Cody. Thank you. The title of this presentation is a quote from a farmer in this study who's talking about organic, ac organic farming in both Peru and the US. The Biofiria Miraflores, this is the market I'll be talking about. This is basically the focus of this study. Biofiria in this context is basically describing a farmer's market, but a farmer's market different from markets that are more common in the US so, or more common throughout Peru. Unlike most markets in Peru, the biggest difference here is that all the vendors at this particular market are certified organic by an NGO that helped establish the market almost 15 years ago. So the market began in 1998 uh, with a whole series of sort of organic NGOs that provide this third party certification in addition to a lot of the infrastructure to create this market. It's made up of individual producers, cooperatives, processed food vendors, and a whole host of organic agriculture advocacy organizations. One study claims that over a thousand farmers are indirectly or directly represented through this one farmer's market. The demographics at the market, similar to markets in the US, farmers markets anyways, reflect the, the local clientele, the, lo the local consumers at this market. So here, this is an affluent district of Lima. We have uh, a lot of tourists, development sector workers, and things like that. Um, the customers that come to this market talk about eating healthy as a primary motivation for shopping and buying organic produce. Just some examples of what you might see at the market. Again, these are a lot of common fruits and vegetables that we'll see at farmers markets throughout different parts of the US. Um, in addition to some less common ones like Oyuko and, and Oka, but we also have things like organic vegan wraps. And in the park behind the market, you'll often see classes and yoga classes, drum circles, you know, um, other classes about local bee production or biodynamic gardening, things like that. So the sense that this Biofaria represented something totally familiar, yet also foreign, inspired this research project. So given the similarities with US farmers markets, I was interested to know what elements of US-based scholarship could be applied to the domestic market for organic produce in Peru. In addition, what makes this market in Peru different from U.S. farmers markets? So along those lines, I argue that the Biofilia in Miraflores has the potential to affect social and ecological change and to encourage a different reading of the market-based critiques found in U.S. scholarship that suggest that these kinds of markets are really ill-suited to addressing some broader social and environmental concerns in the sense they're, they're, they're replicating a lot of those market tendencies that aren't addressing these, these bigger issues. Um, the, among other reasons, the Peruvian case here is unique in that it exists because of the support of an active NGO sector focused on rural development. Just to give you a brief roadmap of where I'll be going, I'm going to talk a little bit about the methodology, how I got involved in this project, uh, and then two illustrations of the Biofiria focusing on, on two different vendors from this farm. Um, so one I'm calling a sort of an organic entrepreneur and their connection to rural development in Peru, and then another farm that's situated in a, in a, in a broader context uh, in a zone where, where organic agriculture really took off, certified organic agriculture, I'll say. 
um, in this region just south of, of Lima. Um, and then I'll end by talking a little bit about the, the conclusion and some of the implications of this research. I came to this topic, well, initially through as a farmer, you know, working at farmers markets in Northern California, focusing on research uh, or conducting research that looked at some of the challenges facing beginning farmers in organics, but also through my involvement with this organization called MESA, the Multinational Exchange for Sustainable Agriculture. MESA runs an exchange program that brings individuals from around the global south to the U.S. to do an internship on an organic farm and then ideally take some of that knowledge and experience back to their home countries. So many of the individuals that, I've, that I interviewed for this project are, are participated in this MESA program and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this, this research is an attempt to kind of provide an overview of the market. So I'm looking at some of the, the representatives of the organic NGOs um, some of these entrepreneurs that are, that are selling products at the market, members of local organic cooperatives and farmers and farm laborers, all involved one way or another with this particular farmer's market. The first person I'll talk about is Gracile and her business um, called Vacas Felices. So this is, to me, an example of organic entrepreneurialism that supports rural development. And this biophilia-based business, I'm going to argue, sort of has the potential at least to improve livelihoods of rural producers, right? So making an argument that it's about that this market can have a kind of impact that goes beyond just the point of sale at this one particular farmer's market. Vacas Felices. So uh, uh, Gracile participated in the MESA program in 2007. She was on an organic dairy farm in New Jersey. And when she returned, her and her family uh, decided to sort of reinvest in their, their small cheese making business at that time and sought out a local community or a, region, a rural community about an hour and a half from Lima where they were going to source their milk. The familiar aspects of this, you know, are that they're direct marketing all their produce through the farmer's market um, in a new bio bodega, which I'll talk about in a second. And it's a value added operation, family run business committed to these kind of principles of social, ecological, and economic sustainability. There's a couple of pictures of Gracile and some of the products that they offer. The business has been expanding, and recently they opened up this Bio Bodega, again, where you're going to find a lot of products that you might also find in the U.S., you know, sprouted grains. Um, they also grow mushrooms in the community where they're sourcing their milk. So. You know, based on this, one might suggest that the organic businesses like these, catering to an affluent clientele, are really ill-suited to addressing broader social and environmental goals of an alternative food system. But I'm going to argue that this business has also had a positive impact on a rural community far from the biophilia. So in this rural community, Despite some of the similar appearances of the business, it's operating in a, in a very sort of distinctly Peruvian context. Um, this is the community of dairy farmers that supplies the milk. Gracile and her family are newcomers to this community, which raises some interesting questions I'll address at the end of this story. And it's similar to a community in, in, that you might find in other parts of Peru, um, farmers basically growing for subsistence and for the market. It's almost entirely farming population. Gracile and her family are providing, um, you know, an income to a lot of these dairy farmers that they weren't, that they didn't previously have. They're, they're paying a better price for their milk, and it's a more reliable and stable income than they were getting by selling their milk at local markets that would eventually transport the, the milk to Lima. I like these two pictures in particular. To me, this sort of represents that, that point of intersection between tradition and innovation, right? So this is milk coming in on the donkey in these homemade saddlebags, two-liter bottles, to then be sort of transferred into this value-added product that's sold at the Bioferia in Peru. You know, this also raises some, some important issues. So for example, this farmer is never going to be able to afford this cheese, ever, right? In addition, because Gracile and her, and her family are newcomers to this town and because their operation is expanding 
it raises the question about whether or not they're going to retain that kind of commitment to a community. So at some point, this community might not be able to supply the amount of milk needed for them to grow their, their business. So right now, they're still farming here, but I think as this business grows, that's going to be a, a decision that they're going to have to come to eventually. So the next story I'm going to tell is about the development of the domestic market for organic produce in Peru. So I just talked about the ways those are potentially problematic. Manantial is an organic farm I'll talk about that is similar to a lot of organic farms that we see in the U.S., and yet the context in, this, in which this farm is operating is, is quite distinct, um, mostly as a result of, of one NGO in particular that was really instrumental in developing certified organic agriculture in the region and the farmer's market. So, Manantial is what I'm going to call a familiar sort of small-scale, even micro, organic farm. Um, it was founded by a beginning farmer without a college background, or without a farming background, straight out of college, was really excited about organic farming, and convinced her parents actually to purchase this land. She was also affiliated with one of the, the NGOs working in this area and decided that with this NGO and this organic farm that they could build, they could market this produce through a farmer's market. So this is kind of in part how the Biofidia emerged. Um, so they've been certified organic since 1998. They're selling, you know, almost all of their produce at the Biofidia in addition to some restaurants. And they're also, you know, challenged economically. I think that like a lot of small farms, they have trouble um, basically paying labor costs in addition to sort of profitability of the farm. The farm is in part subsidized because the land owners are, are essentially not charging any rent. So these are in some ways sort of organic patrons. Again, a lot of sort of situations that, that might be common amongst small scale, especially beginning farmers in the US. However, unlike farms in the US, this particular farm got its start as a result of one particular NGO in the region, Wayuna. And this NGO has been really instrumental in developing what I'm calling organic pioneers. And these are farmers who were essentially growing you know, organic produce, but weren't certified organic. So right at, this, at this point, before the NGO came in, their knowledge and expertise didn't have the same kind of value. And I think there, there are sort of some positive aspects of that and some challenges aspects of that. So the NGO came in in the mid-90s. They started with projects aimed at at essentially reducing the use of pesticides among local farmers. A lot of the farmers in this region are growing commercial crops like apples and cotton, and those two crops in particular, you know, as markets around the world started to expand and become more integrated, became less profitable. And so a lot of farmers you know, were thinking about ways they could diversify and, get, and still maintain a certain price premium. And this is when you know, the organic NGO came in and started providing trainings, a demonstration farm, um, and things to essentially help these farmers um, create new markets for their organic produce. Um, like I said, these, these organic pioneers, in some ways, they were already doing this. They were already growing food without pesticides, and they were already growing food based on, on, on traditional farming practices that they had learned from generations. And the NGO came in and decided that, that what they were doing could be commercialized. And you know, which raises some interesting questions, especially in regards to those farmers who didn't receive the organic certification, those farmers who can't afford the three-year transition period or the, the, the cost of the certification itself to then benefit in a, in a sort of commodity sense from that value, from that knowledge and expertise that they're bringing to the farming system. Um, in addition, we see a lot of individuals from the cooperative come in and I'll show you a couple of them here. So this is, these are some of the organic pioneers that I was talking about. Um, this is uh, the road to the demonstration farm, which is in itself problematic in that it's not entirely a model of sustainability, if you can see uh, based on the terrain it's based in. Um, and then some photos from the organic cooperative. So what I was going to say about that is there are the, there's a high attrition rate in the cooperative. We see a lot of farmers coming in uh, with this economic incentive to benefit from the price premiums of organic, but that over the long haul, they're, they're not necessarily um, able to maintain that commitment 
due to the fluctuating prices. Um, so in the end, I argue that this Bioferia in Miraflores, um, with the distinctions it has in Peru, encourages a different reading of critical scholarship on market-based alternative food initiatives. Um, that it provides opportunities for the expression of social and ecological values, that it can facilitate rural development, and increase participation and attention to alternative food movement in general, though not without its own problems, just similar to market-based initiatives we have here. You know, and these come in, in a lack of awareness among consumers and producers. Um, this market being so dependent on an affluent clientele has limits to its growth that a lot of these people are critically reflecting on but are not necessarily able to address because there's only so much uh, wealthy population. There are bioferias in other parts of the state or in other parts of Lima and other parts of the country that aren't nearly as successful um, as this one here, which is by far the most successful of its kind. So lastly, I think this research has the potential to expand our geographic frame of reference of alternative food networks by focusing on examples from the global south, <clears throat> to determine what alternative food practices work well in what places and why, why not. And then to develop what, what Abrahams has called a, a globally useful conception of alternative food networks. So by looking at farmers markets in these, in these sort of global context. We can see what elements carry over from the north, what's unique about Peru, and how we can reflect back on markets in the US based on some of those distinctions. And I think lastly, one thing that this research can help do is inspire and improve international exchange programs like MESA and, and providing some kind of practical application um, by looking at things like farmers markets or value added dairy products and things like that. So lastly, I'll just say that this research was made possible by these institutions, and thank you.